Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, lovely people, to our very first of this new series, Ask the Expert. I'm so, so excited to have Adrian here with us. And before I get you to quickly introduce yourself, um, we just had a quick chat before we went live on camera and was we were trying to figure out how we actually connected. We've been connected for many years now on Facebook. I don't believe we've ever met in person, but uh, I know that we've been connected for I don't know, seven years plus, I cannot remember really. Uh, but there was always um, a lot of connections in the background, common friends. And uh, then we finally did a, a talk together, a campfire panel discussion where we were both invited to speak. And after that, I said, I want you to come to my group and speak about this topic because the topic that we touched on was antidepressants and grief. And we'll definitely go there. But before we do, Adrian, would you do us the honour to introduce yourself to our audience, please? Yeah, look, firstly, thank you for inviting me. And it's so uh, beautiful to be uh, an honouring to be able to come into a group like yours. Um, very, very special. Thank you for that. Uh, so a little bit of background for myself. Um, if I if I go back many, many, many years as I was a teenager, obviously, you know, things like depression and things were hardly ever really talked about. Um, anxiety was hardly ever talked about. You know, people had... Uh, grumpy days and down days and, and blue days um, but really probably only for the last you know 25 30 years um, where depression and anxiety have become huge um, so going back to, to my youth um, I was I was quite, <laughs> quite an entertaining youth I was actually a wild punk rocker as I mm -hmm. uh, as sort of 13 to 17 year old I had mm -hmm. I had the mohawk and uh, was into my wild crazy music and uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, live, live with my uh, mum. Uh, we were separated, and uh, notice with with my own parents. You know, obviously their own journey, uh, particularly around my mum being a little bit depressed, particularly you know trying to bring up three children um, as a single mum. So I was becoming aware as a as a teenager of different behaviours and different um, um, soul moods and and different um, anxieties and depressions and things around me, uh, and then. In my, uh, around about the age of 18, 19, I traveled around Europe, lived in Berlin for a few years. Oh, wow. um, yeah, I was in Berlin for uh, for three years and uh, loved loved it. It was a great place. And then when I was 24, I met my, my first wife, who was an Australian, hence coming to Australia at the age of 24. And I moved from Berlin to Tasmania. Now, if you can imagine the culture shock of moving from Berlin to Hobart, it was, <laughs> it was quite a, In fact, I was so shocked. I, I ended up staying in Tasmania for 10 years without leaving the island. Um, <laughs> and, and then finally, 10 years later, I went back to England, back to Europe to see my family and friends. And, uh, and then um, separated um, 20 years ago, uh, remarried 18 years ago to my beautiful wife, Arlene. Uh, between us, we have six, a blend of six children from mm -hmm. 35 to 22 and mm -hmm. we have four grandchildren um, and in terms of my my profession Marie is uh, 22 years uh, 23 years ago I started my training to be a counselor and psychotherapist mm -hmm. and uh, from a holistic perspective and most of my work is based upon the philosopher Rudolf Steiner uh, mm -hmm. people may have heard of Steiner school and uh, yeah. different things so so my life really for the last 30 years uh, plus, it's been around the world of Rudolf Steiner. So all my research, all my uh, coaching, counselling, psychotherapy is based around that spiritual soul perspective. So it's a bit more than just the cognitive space in my work. Um, yeah. Just a bit of a background, too, that um, is probably quite pertinent to, to you in the group as well. Uh, for three and a half years, I worked with a beautiful man called Dr. Ian Gawler in Victoria, who mm -hmm. ran a cancer retreat centre, and actually worked there for three and a half years. So I saw a lot of a lot of grief, um, obviously, with people, you know, losing um, their, their partners, um, their, their family members, their friends uh, to cancer. So, yeah, that was a quite a deep, um, a moving time for me for three and a half years down in Victoria, working um, at the retreat centre with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, yeah, so that's probably just a little bit of a snippet of, um, of, of mm -hmm. my background, just to give people uh, an idea of yeah. who the green is. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I believe everybody listening to your introduction can see why I ask you to come here and chat to us. And uh, also, uh, as I already mentioned before, you know, in our panel discussion where we talked about ways out of depression, uh, there was four of us actually uh, talking. And uh, when you touched on this um, antidepressants and what they actually do, I thought uh, 
there are so many things that I still don't know because I'm not a doctor. I don't have that as a background. I'm also not a psychotherapist. Uh, I am a coach. So I thought bringing us together here to uh, to our group and sharing this far and wide, this is really uh, the intention behind that is to open people's minds further and further and uh, really seeking for a little bit more background and knowledge and truth before uh, they go the very often so obvious suggested path of you're in grief, here are the antidepressants. And both you and I, Adrian, wanted to put a bit of a disclaimer out there that uh, we're not sitting here to say do not take them, but we're sitting here to share a little bit more information and to make your decisions a little bit more informed and also offer you alternatives and not saying this is better than that, but alternatives to uh, to see what's actually out there. So uh, we want to keep this as neutral as possible. And I know that you're great at that. I love that you come from a holistic, from a very spiritual, spiritual background, because uh, that's exactly how I approach it too. And it, it's very, very close to my heart. And uh, we will be talking uh, so much about the heart space and the soul as well. So I'd love to dive right into that, if that's okay with you, Adrian. Sure. Um, because I know that here in the group, in Loving Life After Loss, we've got uh, just uh, over 50% of people um from the us and i also know that in particular in the us antidepressants are usually the number one thing that are suggested when somebody approaches a doctor with a topic of grief and i'm not a huge fan of that i'm not a huge fan of here's the problem here's the solution and that's a pill um Let's delve a little bit into that. Can you maybe start by sharing what you shared in the panel discussion, uh, what antidepressants actually do to your body and why why is that the number one go-to thing that uh, doctors subscribe when it comes to grief? Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, look, in, in the main, what happens is when people start to look at depression, and I'm going to put anxiety in there too, because uh, yeah. a lot of the, the, the medical fraternity they put the two together and actually use the same medication for both, which is, is a, bit, a bit erratic. I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, what happens is all the research is done on the fact that they believe that um, depression is in the mind or in the brain. And which for me is a false pretext to begin with, because from a holistic perspective, our emotions and feelings live in the soul. They don't mm. live in the head or the mind. Yeah. You know, some, sometimes they're a little bit mind connected, but mostly if you really get to an understanding of, the idea of what the soul represents from a holistic perspective, all our emotions, all our feelings, all the grief we go through sits in the soul. It doesn't sit in the mind or in the brain at all. So, so straight away, when, when I look at that, I say, well, where's the research um, for antidepressants around the soul? And there's simply, there's no match for that. So, yeah. so there's a social a false pretext but to, to begin with, of, of even on the research for me. So when, when I look at what antidepressants do, firstly, people are given something that's actually going to go to the wrong place. <laughs> it's not going into the soul. It's, it's going to the brain and, and doing all the, um, all the blockers and the inhibitors and things that happen in the neuron pathways it's, is what they're trying to do. They're trying to block, um, if you like, that depression and, mm -hmm. and, and play around with the serotonin and, and, and the different things. People have probably have done their own research on that. I don't need to probably explain that too much. But for me, it's let's begin right back at the beginning um, of, of the cause and the effect, because I think that's where we always begin from a scientific perspective before we even get into the spiritual perspective. So mm -hmm. for me, it's, let's go back to the beginning and say, where am I feeling my anxiety? Where am I feeling my depression? Mm -hmm. It always comes back. I'm feeling it in my feeling body, in my, in my soul, in my sentient self. Mm -hmm. and not in my brain so when people start to take the medication what it does it does block the feelings you know it can block the feelings of grief as, as we as you know and you've probably yeah. spoken about that too so rather than releasing the grief and working on the anxiety oftentimes what happens with the antidepressants it does depress down and it stops the natural process of grief it stops the natural process of getting into some rage and some anger which is actually a controlled anger is a great great therapy mm. if it is because rather otherwise it gets blocked down um and i'll just give you a little bit of a um a physiological um as well uh, explanation i was working with a client a few years ago and we worked out her medication she was on about seven medications a day which is quite common most people have 
something to overcome something else to overcome something else to overcome something else whether it's weight loss or sleeplessness because of the side effects of um, mm -hmm. certain medications yeah. so we worked out the physical weight of the medications you were taking you know most medications now are, are powder form so we said if we actually took all that powder form of medication over a 12 month period of what's in your body this one client she'd worked out with all the different milligrams of different things she was taking she was she'd taken 800 grams of powdered medication in 12 months wow. now i don't know if you can imagine you know that's 800 grams that's nearly a kilo of powder medication powder that's gone into her body mm. now the effect that that would have on the bloodstream um the gut the gut biome um and everything else in the body is quite incredible mm. and this is common most people are usually between about you know 300 grams in a kilo of you know sort of powdered medication a year mm. and if you think of that that's that's an incredible amount so so from a physiological perspective for me, that's that's very dangerous because it's going to have a really ill effect on the body from a yeah. psychological perspective when we're not dealing with things because things are being blocked. That's for me, is quite a, a dangerous arena to play in. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I hope it gives a little bit of <laughs> a little bit of a beginning overview, uh, Maria, um, of, you know, for me, the um, the, the downside of um, antidepressant medication from a physiological and psychological perspective. And the side effects, I mean, in the old days, you used to buy the box of medication and you'd pull out the big sheet that had all, nowadays it's just a barcode. And if you actually scan the barcode and go and read, it's yeah. amazing some of the major side effects and then some of the lesser side effects. Um, but there are hundreds, you know, from a physiological and psychological perspective. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, when the doctors give out the medication, they don't really understand or know their clients so well generally. You can go and see a doctor for the first time and be you know, given a Prozac or some other um, a drug, and the doctor hasn't even really given you a full analysis of who you are from a, a you know a mental perspective, a, a, a physiological perspective, a um, you know what's happening in your life. Yeah. Um, those questions are hardly ever asked. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like giving out pills so willy nilly. It's uh, it's a dangerous prison to set for many for many doctors. Yeah, there, there are a couple of things that came up while you were talking that I want to address, but I um, I, I try to do that in, in in order so I don't lose track of it when yeah. I mention one. But uh, one of them was when you said uh, you know rather than dealing with the anger and and I um, you know I, I want to say one thing about anger here because I know that a lot of people in our group here um, have said to me I've never felt anger and neither have I to be honest I was never angry at Rob for dying and it sounds maybe weird when I say it in that way you know but I do understand that um, I've had people tell me this you know I'm still angry at my husband for leaving me and I remember having this discussion with somebody at the retreat and I said well your husband didn't leave you he passed away you know there is there's no malintention behind that there is no separation intention behind that if that makes sense the outcome is the same but the intention is not so I just wanted to throw that in there because I I know that some people might be watching this going like but I, I was never angry um I know that I had to deal with anger in my life quite a bit but it never had anything to do with Rob and it was mostly before I met Rob actually and I have since learned to befriend anger when it does come because I know it's just a messenger. I know it's just somebody coming. If you see it in sense of a person, really, um, I often do that. I personify emotions to deal with them better, to be able to talk to them, if that makes sense. Yeah. I just want to explain it for some people thinking, what is she <laughs> on about? Um, you know, when anger comes, I, I befriend it because I feel it's there to protect me. It's there to keep me safe from something that's underneath or standing behind anger that I'm not ready to deal with yet, that I'm not ready to look at yet. So with anger and, and with antidepressants, actually, it's just the same. I believe it's a, it's a matter of creating a safe space where you can deal with the emotion. And I understand that from a medical perspective, that's exactly what they're trying to do. But is that exactly what happens, actually, when you said uh, it just puts a block on it? Some people might be sitting here thinking, well, that's exactly what I need. I just need to block the pain for now. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about that. What are the alternatives and where do antidepressants help and where do they not? Because I think it's quite important to look at both sides of the story. Yeah. So, so, so for my take, um, and look, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so, um, you know, this is, this is my personal uh, belief system around my own psychotherapy work is um, when one, you know, feels that um, emotion of, of depression, of anxiety, and usually people do go into that panic or they go go down. I think sometimes for a short-term period, antidepressants are really great. They take the edge off. It's like if you cut yourself, you put a Band-Aid on, it, it stops the bleeding. And I, so I think in, in some cases, it's, it's a great thing. The danger comes is when it becomes um, habitual mm-hmm. and is then taken often unnecessarily because mm-hmm. it just becomes a habit. You go back to the doctor every month and just prescribe the same without doing the psychotherapy work, without really looking behind the scenes of, you know, how are you doing today? You know, are you do doing- I understand it correctly when I say that's basically just numbing it, but not healing anything? Is yeah, that right? absolutely. Yeah, just, just numbing the pain, just taking the edge off the pain uh, mm-hmm. because depression is painful, anxiety is painful, grief is painful. Um, mm-hmm. But in, in terms of the anger, ang- anger is quite a common thing that I work with in, in my space, particularly with my men. Um, anger is what I call a secondary emotion nearly always um, underneath anger there's a deeper emotion so anger is just the um, the spotlight on something else that's going on whether that could be frustration resentment um, grief sadness yeah grief sadness so when the anger comes up it's let's look let's deal with the anger and you know it's okay to get angry as long as nobody gets hurt in the process but then it's really necessary to go underneath the anger and ask what the real deeper emotion is now when one's on medication, oftentimes that's really difficult to even look at that underlying emotion because it's really hard to get there because the door is closed. Mm. The antidepressants close the door on the ability for us to take ourselves in into that emotional space to look at it. I'm a great believer if, if we name it, we can tame it. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, with some medications, we can name it, but we can never tame it because we don't have the ability to feel what's actually going on because it's a feeling inhibitor hence yeah. that's why it's a soul it blocks what's happening in the soul as well um, yeah so yeah so there, and there's many many different types of personalities that deal with things in different ways as you mentioned marie some people feel anger and some don't some yeah. have more propensity to go towards anger and others do it but so oftentimes people are angry but they're so afraid to express it they're mm-hmm. really afraid to. So what they do, they swallow the anger. So um, so we say, you know, exploded anger is one thing and repressed anger is, is totally another emotion yeah. that we have to sometimes learn to release that. And yeah. the more you take the medication of antidepressants, the harder it is sometimes to release that, that yeah. anger. And, and it gets just buried deeper. So some of the alternatives for me are, um, and this is where I think it's really, really, really important to work with your medical medical practitioner who's willing to sit and listen, who's willing to work, if you like, in a team. Yeah. Not just going to walk in, give you a pill, and you walk out. And you, I think in Australia now, the average um, consultation is 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you see a doctor for 20 minutes, you get double billed. Yeah. Yeah, which is quite incredible. So you get, yeah. Yeah, you get double billed if it's more than 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm happy to share something um, that's quite personal, but you know, yeah. this is this is what I do in my group all the time. Anyway, it, I share something whenever I feel that people can get something out of that, or um, uh, it helps them on their healing journey. And uh, when Rob passed away, I went to a positive psychologist for about four months, and uh, a lot of people in here have actually met her. It's Emily May. She did something quite similar, uh, like you do with me now. She came on a monthly basis, and we chatted about different topics, which you have now agreed to, to do, which I really love. Um, so, anyway, just apart from the side story, I got to a space through my work with Emily, my personal work, like working on my own grief, on my own healing journey, because um, my biggest thing is always like I. I I put the focus on the healing, not so much on the grief. The healing is something that that just happens when when you really put your focus into that. Uh, I always felt, and this is, again, just my personal way of dealing with this, that when I put too much focus on the grief, then 
there's not enough space for the healing, if that makes sense. I know I'm sidetracking a little bit here now, but uh, the one thing that I wanted to get to actually was that um, lately, about two months ago, I started having uh, more and more anxiety and I felt it, I felt it, as you said, in my body, you know, in, in my case, I often felt it like a heart racing, like really not being able to calm down. And it was always about my role as a soul parent me questioning that um, did the way that I handled my healing journey also suit my boys or not? Did I provide a space safe enough for them to actually heal, to actually talk about their feelings? Or was my focus so strongly on this escape into happiness, like I now call it, um, because this was my way of not feeling the pain. You know, I didn't want to numb it. I didn't want to, um, yeah, I didn't want to go down the road of antidepressants, let's name it. I wanted to create happiness. So my path was always like, how can I create the happiest life possible for them and myself? And looking back now, I have no regrets. I would do it the exact same way again. I hope I'll never be given the chance to prove that, but I really feel that was the right path. However, I started questioning, you know, did I provide enough space for the boys for healing? Did I do the right thing? So I, I got really anxious around that. And when I noticed that it became quite almost like ever present, I thought, okay, this is my clue. I need to, um, I need to go back to therapy. And unfortunately, Emily was not practicing anymore. So I, I felt a bit hesitant at first because I thought, oh, here we go. I have to tell my whole story again. And, and you know, for a lot of people listening here, they might be able to relate to that. When you see a new uh, counselor, therapist, psych psychotherapist, whatever your choice is, um, you do have to get through your story again. You know, that's just the fact. They, they have to get to know you. You have to build that relationship, that trust. And I was very, very lucky that I found one first go that I really trust. And she is phenomenal. She's really fantastic in the work that she does. Um, and so I started working with Michelle um, about five weeks ago now. And I remember going to the doctor because here in Australia, um, as most of you know, there is this, oh, you can get a mental health plan and it helps with the cost. It keeps the cost down by roughly, let's say 50%. I don't know exactly, but um, it does help a great deal uh, in terms of when you go on a regular basis. So I decided to go and get a health plan and I had one back then, but I have since changed doctors um, and so I had to explain the whole thing again. And I sat there in this office and this lady looks at me and, and says, um, so I see you've had a mental health plan already in 2018. Why, what did you do? And I said, well, my husband passed and I decided to go to therapy for a while. And she said, yeah, but why did you go to therapy? And my jaw just dropped on my, on my lap. And I, I thought, did she not hear me right? Or... And I looked at her and I said it in exactly that time. I said, because my husband passed. Yeah. And she said, yeah, so why did you go to therapy? And I just shook my head and I was like, Are you, is, is this for real? Is this actually happening? I, I felt so offended and so vulnerable. And I'm a very confident woman, as most people know. And I sat there and I had no words. I literally had no words of why. I'm like, how can you ask me this? My husband died. I needed help with that. And then I had to sit and go through this whole questionnaire. Do you ever think of this? And do you ever think of that? And I'm like, I'm not depressed. I'm not suicidal. I just need help with this. I've got anxiety around that. And she's like, I said, have I been diagnosed? And she went so, and I'm like, I don't need to be diagnosed or not diagnosed if it's officially anxiety or if, or if I just feel anxious. I want somebody to talk to. I need help with that. And I felt here is this ambivalent feeling and that's why I'm sharing this very personal story with you and everybody else listening where you wish for a doctor to ask more questions and to be more precise and to be more helpful with their choice of whether or not to medicate and if how to medicate yet then you know take my example and I'm sitting here completely willing and open to talk about things and she questions why on earth I would go to therapy after my husband died. So this makes me understand why a lot of people do not want to even go there. It's very confronting. 
it's yeah. so confronting to reach out for help anyway it takes it takes a lot for some people to step up and speak out and say you know what I need help with this and I knew that I needed help with this and especially with the field that I work on I work in if I don't help myself how can I help others you know so it was very important for me to take this very important step of self-care and self-love and really looking into that and the work that we're doing is phenomenal so I know that was a very long story to walk around this but I really wanted to share that what is your um from a professional point of view what is your advice for people listening to this thinking where do I even start when I don't even know what I need yeah I think this is where the sense of community the sense of community can really help in in this space because at some point somebody in the community would have found a good doctor yeah Yeah. and I think you know if there's there's a process of being able to share with each other uh, maybe that's something I don't know if you've got that resource yet um, in your group but uh, particularly for people living in same regions, um, mm-hmm. having a resource of, you know, who are the good practitioners to go and talk to. Yeah. Oftentimes, if you're going down the journey and you're seeing um, another practitioner, you know, perhaps a holistic practitioner for your kinesiology or, or whatever else you're doing, oftentimes they are connected to good doctors as well. So yeah. it's always worth ask even massage therapists, you know, and other people, they know in their communities of, of the good doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd suggest it's probably worth really asking around. Um, on the, I'm on the Gold Coast in Australia, and um, there's a couple of okay, you know, doctors here that I can I can work with. Actually, <laughs> I went for a medical checkup 18 months ago now. Or, yeah, we've been actually nearly two years ago. It's in in January, um, uh, at a beautiful uh, doctor that a friend of mine uses. First uh, medic, full medical I've had for 17 years. I just felt the need yeah. to go and. Uh, get checked um you know with my age now coming up to nearly 60 and I thought uh, a clean bill of health of course but it was great to find a doctor who was willing to sit and talk to me and understand me um in from a holistic perspective and he was recommended from a friend um mm. so I was very lucky to, to find him um yeah. you know particularly over the last two or three years it's been quite a challenging time for a lot of people in terms of you know what's been going on on the planet so finding the right doctor to sit yeah. and talk to is really really important and I think it's yeah sort of an essential part of the healing journey yeah. is to have that doctor that will sit and listen and understand your needs. Yeah. I love, that, I love that you say that. And may I add just after what I've just shared, my very personal experience, also don't be afraid to change doctors if you're not happy. I felt I felt so confronted by the way she handled it. And um, I understand there was a very... I'd say it was a cultural difference and a different cultural background uh, handle certain emotions very differently. So I took that into consideration as well, but I couldn't help feeling very confronted by her and very much not understood. I thought, how how else can I explain that, you know? So um, my decision has actually already been made and I've already passed it on to my counsellor that I said, I will give you different details from a doctor because I'm not going back to her. Um, So I was happy with the outcome, with the counsellor that I found, but I wasn't happy with the way I was treated uh, or questioned uh, by my doctor. So please don't be afraid to change your doctor if you feel misunderstood. Uh, This is my biggest message here. You know, I understand that it is uh, sometimes confronting and sometimes exhausting having to take your whole history and, you know, and getting to know another doctor. It's it's almost the same like starting off with a new counsellor. But as you said, Adrian, it is so important to have somebody who takes the time and looks at it from a holistic perspective because, uh, there is not just medication. So with that being said, here's my nice bridge being built to what are the alternatives? Let's look into that for a little bit. Um, and then I definitely want to come back and talk about the pros and cons of antidepressants maybe a little bit more. But let's start oh. with some alternatives um, yeah. and, and the soul journey that you mentioned there before. Let's talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah. I think one important uh, factor is that you've already mentioned you do have a, you know, a counsellor you're working with. I, I think in some cases... Yeah, having a coach or a counsellor is, is is essential in this day and age. Uh, just to have um, somebody in your team that really does understand. It's okay to talk to the hairdresser, talk to family members, but oftentimes they're not professionals in that space. So I think, you know, it's great to have non-professionals in your team and you can go and talk and cry and, and let go, whether it's a hairdresser or you know, yeah. whatever it is in your life. But to have that professional who's been trained in the space, I think it's, it, it's essential. 
you know, I have my, you know, my business coaches, my personal coaches, uh, my mm-hmm. psychotherapy coaches. Um, and, uh, I think it's really important to have a sense of team, a sense of community, um, particularly around grief. I, I think it's it's essential because uh, it can be a very lonely journey, as as you know, occasionally, um, if you go in the grief journey, because it gets to a point, doesn't it, after a while of you feel like you're telling the same story over and over and over and again, and who's going to listen? And, and oftentimes you get the sense of the same person doesn't want to hear my story more than once or twice, whereas a professional is paid to sit and listen to that. Mm. And hopefully somebody who has empathy and understanding and, and depth to, to not only listen, but to help you to slowly move on from that journey and, yeah. and, and to get back into, into living life um, um, again, which is, is oftentimes a long journey. So I think essentially some of the tools are, you know, get somebody on your team. Mm. And then the second thing is, there's a few things is to get oneself through the healing process. I'm a great believer in using some form of art. So whether that's painting, play, sculpture, um, mm. you know, even, even crochet or knitting or woodwork, yeah. it's something to engage the soul process. Because mm. when you're in an art space, it's a soul activity. Mm. So we're healing the soul through the process of doing a soul activity. Yeah. yeah, because art doesn't really come from the mind or, or the brain. Um, I love that you say that. I, I didn't even, yeah, because after uh, Rob passed, I went and did an art class and uh, I went and did, uh, I painted a trilogy for Flynn, Jed and I after Rob passed. And it was beautiful because nobody knew who I was there. Here in town, everybody knew me as that young widow, a fresh widow. And there I was Marie. Yeah. Nobody knew about anything and I didn't share I just sat there and uh, it was amazing. Mm. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm a great believer in art therapy. I do a lot of work with my clients with art, you know, so whether it's painting, drawing, clay work, um, you know, yeah. going into nature and building in nature. Um, and, and nature, of course, getting, getting fresh air, you know, really getting into that expansive space because oftentimes with depression and anxiety, there's yeah. a sense of being internalized. Yeah. So to turn that around into expansion, which mm-hmm. is a really healing process, is you know, walking on the beach, walking in nature, um, mm. climbing a mountain, just yeah. to feel that you're not trapped in this anxiety or depression because it can be quite a trapped feeling, as as you can probably attest, um, it, uh, Marie. It's it can be like, you know quite a quite a hard place to break out of from. So I think nature is one of the the greatest tools. Um, one of the other things I, I put. I agree. On <laughs> here is um, I think one of the other things too is when one is in in that space. It's hard to recognize one's purpose mm. and that's when okay. one can find a deeper purpose in life, whether that's um, personal or even in business, you know, if you have a purpose in your business or, or in your life, um, mm. that's a really important thing to hold on to because it's like setting the sat nav. Mm. I'm going to keep working on my purpose. It gives you some sense of something to live for yeah. and to something to move out from because if you get stuck in the, depressed space or the anxiety space and there's nothing to drive you out of that yeah. it's easy to stay in the spiral of depression but if yeah. there's something outside of oneself so it could be going to work for instance for a charity getting a good charity cause um, the purpose might to become um, a writer it might be just to be a beautiful mother or father that, mm-hmm. that's a great purpose too yeah. but I, th- I think the important thing is to define one's purpose and the best way to define one's purpose is to really write it down and, and get clear on it. You know, I define I think, my purpose as. Yeah, I, I want to say something here because I, I, at our retreats, that topic of purpose comes up a lot. Yeah, yeah, and um, I have a slightly different uh, perspective on that to you. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to share it here and maybe discuss it a little bit because I agree mostly with what you say in terms of, you know, it is important for us to have a purpose, but I also see the other side where people say, I, I just don't know what my purpose is, you know, and they um, they they are so um, trying, they're trying so hard to find the purpose that uh, often they don't, they get sidetracked from their healing journey because like uh, they become more lost trying to find a purpose than they would be if they would just stay in the moment. So I feel uh, there there is always different um, situations that could be quite unique. And um, I've worked with quite a few people that just simply didn't know what their purpose was. 
And I said, let's just work on acceptance more. And what I do is I call it, uh, for me, my in my personal journey, I call it the observer mode. Yes. I allowed myself to just sit and observe what was going on. You know, there was um, I, in, in one of my healing journeys, I'm, I call that the hole in the hill experience. And it happened to me when I came back from my journey around the world and the boys went back to school. And I knew that I was about to start the movement. But there was this gap of like three weeks in between from us coming back before I started it. And I found myself like completely in this nothingness. I had nothing prepared in the first for the first time in nine months after Rob died. I had no plan of what to do for the next couple of days. So I realized I was sitting in between this what felt to me like a dark hole, what most people probably refer to as depression and this little pile of happiness, which I created, you know, these new little happy memories that we built and they were amazing and beautiful, but I felt I had nothing left to climb up there to get a better view, if that makes sense. So in that moment, not consciously, I only realized that later that that's what I've been doing. I went into observer mode and just observed what was going on down there. And I knew I didn't want to be down there and what was going on over there. And I knew I had no, you know no power no energy left to climb up there so I allowed myself just to be with no agenda with no purpose with no this is what you have to do today I allowed myself to be and just observe and I think that it's quite important to talk about this as well because what do people do before they find the purpose they need to have that in between or how do I even get there and I often say if you allow yourself to just focus on a now and on a path, and on a next step, and on a next step, and on a next step, eventually the purpose will find you, or you will find the purpose. It doesn't matter which perspective you would like to put on that. But I just wanted to talk about that as well, because I feel often people are in this space of like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you know, and then they become all anxious about not having the purpose and not having found it, and then it makes it actually worse than, well, let's just focus on here, right here, right now, and yeah. uh, that right now they're the two most powerful words, I believe, when you are in this space of trying to find this acceptance. Yeah, and, and I, I think you know, being being in in the in the now in, in the present is mm-hmm. the most powerful tool we have in any journey in life, and yeah. it probably leads me on to one of the other key resources that one can find about being present is the meditation process. You know, finding meditation in one's life, it yeah. can be. It can really take the edge off of, you know, living in anxiety because when if you you meditate well um, Mm -hmm. and you're in the meditative space, there is no time or place for depression, anxiety, fear, doubt, self-hatred, self-loathing, because one's in one's meditative space. So I'd say one of the greatest tools of being in the now and in the presence is to find a meditation um, technique uh, that works. And there are hundreds of techniques and some suit some temperaments and some don't suit others. So it's about finding the right meditation for that space. Mm-hmm. But coming back to that sense of, you know, being the observer and watching myself, I, I do similar in my in my work too in uh, my psychotherapy, and and I think it's really important to recognise that every single person has a different journey. Mm-hmm. And I think this is the importance of having that team member that's willing to sit with you to understand what your journey entails Mm -hmm. and how best your journey is for you going forward because one size doesn't fit all yeah I think that's the important part that you've just you know really spoke about your journey was quite specific for you you know Jane and Bob and Peter and Mary their journeys are going to be very unique and individualized for them as well and it's really important to understand the needs of each individual I call it the wish or the desire Mm which is sort of similar to, you know, what's my my purpose in this little journey going forward, but what's my wish today? What's my desire today? Yeah. This week, this month, this year. And I think that's the important factor always is to individualize everybody's journey. And as a psychotherapist, I, I never have a recipe. If somebody walks in the room, you know, it's a blank canvas. Yeah. Every time they walk in the room, there's mm-hmm. you no, know, I, I, until they've made a wish with me, I always start my sessions with a wish. You know, yeah. what what's your objective or your wish for this session today? Yeah. And that and that's my focus. That's my guidance. So yeah. there's no guesswork. Um, there's, there's not me bringing in what I think or believe my client needs. I yeah. think 
are such an important factor in in the grief journey too mm -hmm. is how would you like to grieve what is your process because some yeah. people grieve and it's over in a shorter term and other people it's a very long long time of grieving because everybody's yeah. so different i think that's the first thing to recognize maria is uh, yeah. the, the individualization of, of any trauma any grief anything people are going through and yeah. that's a, coming up back to the medication is how do we know that this person needs one pill or half a pill without actually understanding their temperament or their blood type or their consciousness because yeah. once again it's like take one pill once a day or two pills twice a day well, yeah. how do we know that's the right measurement for each individual we don't you know, yeah it has to be calculated right. and measured and really thought through before we give any therapy or medication to anybody about the exact measure for each individual i think it's really important yeah i agree with you very much so and mm -hmm. uh can we maybe go back and talk a little bit about the the pros and cons of antidepressants from yeah. you know like just a neutral perspective here and yeah. maybe throw that in there so people uh maybe think about how they address it again we're not here to tell you do or don't we're just here to give you a bit more information to make a more informed decision really yeah okay and i'll give i'll give an example i often use is um you know <clears throat> millions and millions of people across the world every day use you know panadol or whatever headaches mm -hmm. and it's it's short-term relief i've got a headache take a pill 20 minutes later ah oh, my headache's gone yeah yep and then it's okay the headache's gone but what was the cause of the headache in the first place let's go back to the cause and it could be just simply you know lack of water yeah <laughs> because you know if you're not hydrating and drinking two or three liters a day the reality is you're probably going to get a headache you know 90 percent of headaches of course from um lack of hydration from not drinking one two or three liters of water a day so it's com quite common to fix and yet people then get fixated on and the habit of taking the medication for headaches rather yeah. than looking at you know if i take away stress in my life or if i drink more water or take away a certain food type my mm -hmm. headaches will go and it's the same with um antidepressants it becomes a habit after some time so mm -hmm. once again i'm going to reiterate i think occasionally it's great to be on antidepressants short term mm -hmm. to take the edge off to take it particularly if you've just gone through some you know life-changing trauma of of losing a partner or losing a family member or friend it can be really traumatic and it's really hard to operate so just to slow things down to take the edge off i think is a wonderful thing i think you know i, I really support that mm -hmm. when it becomes a habit where the medication most probably is really probably not needed anymore mm -hmm. i think that's the time to look at and say how long have i been on my medication yeah. Can I slowly wean, slowly, slow, I'm going to reiterate, slowly wean myself off with professional guidance. Yeah. And put a few alternatives in place to take place of the medication, i.e., you know, doing yoga, doing meditation, finding a new community, um, finding a hobby, um, doing something more purposeful for myself. What, what are things we can put in place when we take the medication? And finding that delicate balance of slowly taking the um, antidepressants away because as as we know if if on antidepressants it's really hard to go into the soul and do the necessary work to do the healing mm -hmm. and i think so the, the pros and cons are yes it takes the pain away it takes the edge off but then the the flip side the downside of that is we become very dependent mm -hmm. on the medication and can be on it for years and years and then one of the you know the other downsides of course with the side effects with things like you know the lack of libido the sex drive um uh, body weight whether that's you know loss of weight or putting on weight people react differently um, things like headaches things like uh, you know gut problems um there are um, you know, psychological um challenges or side effects as well and if the list goes on and on and on and then unfortunately one goes to the doctor and says, now I'm feeling anxiety as well as depression. So then you get anxiety tablets. Mm -hmm. And then if obesity happens, starts to put on, so then you get obesity tablets. And then the obesity, you know, something else happens, you know, blood diabetes, and then you're on diabetes tablets. 
And before you know it, you're on your 800 grams of medication a year, yeah. which has a really adverse effects on the body. So, yeah. um, so there's some of the sort of the downside of, of what can happen is you can get into the spiral of yeah. um, quite easily, in fact. Um, yeah. So I think having some guidance is really, really important and having somebody to, to guide and say, where are you and what are you doing right now with your, your current situation, your medication? And how can we evaluate that? So I'd say every three months, evaluate. Yeah. Because three months is probably long enough. Six mm -hmm. months is probably long enough short term. Um, and then to start reversing the process, if it's, if it's okay to do so. I'm, I'm not a, yeah. you know, I'm not a, a medical practitioner. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to gauge it carefully. But I would say for anybody watching in, listening in, Marie, please, every three months, sit with a professional and evaluate your situation from a um, psychological, physiological, and yeah. also a soul and spiritual perspective as well. Yeah. And I want to also pick up again what you said before. You know, I just want to highlight that. Find a community that yeah. supports the healing, you know, because often we are uh, in a community that um, that might support that being stuck in the pain, being stuck in a process and they don't know don't even realize it for me the easiest way to check is always when you spend time in a community in a group of people or even just with one person do you feel that you are more energized when you leave or do you feel really drained afterwards and need a break that's a really good giveaway you know when you feel drained when you leave a person or a group of people so mm -hmm. um, check in a little bit more with your heart and feel how you are left after an interaction with a group or with a person. It's quite important. We sometimes don't even think about it. We are so used to, well, that's my doctor. I go there. That's my friend. I go and visit her. Uh, that's, you know, we are so used to this is how it is that we sometimes don't question if it's actually good for us or not. And if that's the only thing that our conversation did today, then I'm already happy, you know. So um, I do not, I so want to thank you for being here today. And as I said before, you know, I'm so grateful that you said yes to doing this on a more regular basis. So we are intending to do this on every first Thursday of the month. And yes, for the US, that's uh, that's a Wednesday, obviously. And I understand that today for the US, it's the last Wednesday of the month. But let's not go there. Let's not overcomplicate it. Uh, my events are always um, in Sydney, Australia time frame. And uh, if you do click on going to the event, you will see it in your time zone anyway to make things very simple here. Adrian, before we go, is there any last message that you would like to share about our today's topic or anything else? Yeah, there's one thing I'd like to bring in um, in terms of a resource, and I think it's a really powerful one, um, and some may be doing it. It's what I call holistic journaling. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, sit down and uh, do what I call the holistic journey. So wh where was I today, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually? And just write a few notes from those four aspects of life. Where yes. was I physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually? And that'll give you some understanding of mm -hmm. your own, own journey. And then you can ascertain what you need to actually fix anything that was out of alignment during the day in terms of your, your medication or your support team. I think it's a really important factor to bring in for the resourcing. I love it. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. And I can't wait to bring you back on camera in one month. It was a real pleasure, Marie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And if you have any questions uh, regarding the topic we discussed today, uh, please just feel free to put them in the comments below. Adrian is in our group. So if you want to tag him in there, I'm sure he'll jump on and uh, respond to that. So thank you so much for being here. This is Adrian and, and Marie signing off. Can't say my own name anymore. <laughs> have a fantastic day. We'll see you soon. Bye for now. Oh, thanks, Lee.